So the last class we talked uh, about uh, XML. You remember that? And we talked about uh, XML schema and uh, XML model and so on and so forth. So the idea is give you, giving to you an idea of what means use adopt XML. Okay. And today I will talk about XML work and metadata. Okay, because for two reasons. First, XML is just the 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 let's say the infrastructure. Okay, and and, and uh, over XML was built a huge uh, universe of uh, standards and things. And also, people talk about XML of, uh, as something to produce metadata. Okay, and we must discuss that because after this class, we will go uh, a bit towards the semantics and talk what is exactly semantics interoperability, semantic interoperability, and so on and so forth. So we need to understand what people are trying to do here, and what uh, which are the limits. Okay. So, uh, so uh, XML, in fact, has two roles. Okay, XML can be seen as a meta language and a language. It's a kind of uh, um, mixture. It's a kind of dual role. Okay, and and this is, in some sense, this brings us some interesting challenges when we want to analyze how people adopt XML, okay? So, uh, so, so I think if we have the air conditioning, it's better to close the door, right? Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's, let's try to remember, let's remember what I told you about XML, okay? So XML is something that we use to design or to um, to define new languages. For example, MathML is an, S an XML language, SVG, and several others. Even the HTML was redesigned as XHTML. Okay. Uh, so let's get one example. I will get one example. And I will go uh, deep in this example to understand if I want to produce a language, how XML works on it. Right? So, for example, uh, SVG is a language which is produced by, uh, defined in XML. And what means if I want to use something in SVG? Okay, so, sorry again, it's Portuguese. I'm not having time to translate everything to English, so but okay. So uh, SVG is an XML format, and I know who know who knows SVG here. Who knows SVG? Nobody knows SVG. No. Oh God. Okay. So what's SVG? SVG is a language. For example, probably you you know Corel Draw, or I don't know something new, new but much more new. I, I usually like to use the draw in OpenOffice. Okay. I don't know if you use some kind of tool to produce drawings. Okay. But when, when you want to store drawings, you want you store in a, in a format we call vectorial format. Vectorial format is you don't store uh, a matrix of pixels is not a matrix, a matrix of pixels. Okay, what we store is the the objects that uh, are compose the draw. Okay, so if you want to produce, for example, a diagram, it will store the squares and the lines and so on and so forth. Okay. You want to annotate it. 
Yes. So store. Of course, yes. This per is a perfect technology. You can use it because, for example, in SVG you can define uh, any polygon or even any kind of uh, path. It's rounds and so on in a vectorial way, and you can put it that it in on top of a bitmap image, a matrix. Okay, so you can even put an overlay on top of it, and you can define the shapes you want, and you can even connect with annotations because this is XML, and you can do that in an XML world. Okay, so it's a perfect technology to do that. Okay. So, uh, I don't know, probably some of you uh, use it some vectorial formats. I will, I will give you some examples. You, you, may, uh, you may recognize. Let me get the pen here. So, for example, WMF. Uh, we have uh, APS. We have um, CDR from CorelDRAW. So all these formats are vectorials. In the sense that if you get a picture stored in this format and you try to, and you open it, the software will show you the objects that compose the picture. Okay? So SVG is one of such standards. Okay? And, uh, but the idea is this will be the web language to produce vectorial images. Okay? Okay. Uh, so then, uh, what they did, they used the language, the meta language in the sense that they used XML, right? to produce a schema okay telling for example if you use the element rect it means a rectangle okay and then you have attributes to define the style the coordinates the width the height and so on and so forth and you can also define a, a circle with a style blah 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 so you can start doing this kind of drawings Okay, so this is an, XML, an SVG file describing this tree. It's in the tree. <laughs> it's a beautiful tree. Okay, so this is an XML file, an SVG file describing this tree. Okay, and what happens? You have a schema, and the schema tells that what you can use and what you cannot use. Okay, but my question is, where is the semantics of the of this schema so how can i know what rectangle or what circle means in the definition of of svg but who reads the definition Humans. Because you mean in the definition or in the schema? In the schema? Do you think that in the schema you can have semantics or just syntax? Exactly. So the thing is, everything has semantics. Everything. Okay? You cannot tell never that something has no semantics. What is something that has no semantics? Okay? Everything has semantics. The problem is, can your machine interpret, automatically interpret the semantics? Okay? Okay. But what is automatically interpret the semantics? 
The challenge is the following. Consider that uh, I now, today, I sit on my desk and I designed a new language or a new standard to describe images, vectorial images, okay? A competitor for SVG, right? Okay? And then I deployed a, 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 a description in my language. Okay? So then you have a program and your program never saw my format. Never. It opens the file and it wants to draw it. Okay? Like it draws an SVG file. Okay? And then it opens it and you, it finds an element like X. Okay? How my application will know, your application will know, the meaning of X? Meaning here, of course, depends on the context, right? For some application, meaning can be what I will do with that, right? So, for example, if uh, I'm considering an application to plot things on the screen, the meaning of a circle, it must know that it draws a circle, right? But how an application will know the meaning of the thing if it never saw this format before? Can you consider that? So the problem is, an schema can tell you precisely, okay, precisely the syntax. Can tell you how the things are organized, how the things are structured, but can can't tell you the meaning of the things. Okay? And where is the meaning? The meaning is in your application. You you define it, you created an application that can read this specific format, can interpret it and you do something, okay? But this interpretation is stored inside your application. In your application knows that circle means draw a circle, okay? Are you agreeing with me? This is, re this is very important and if you are not agreeing with me, you can present your arguments, okay? Because we we'll talk, we'll talk about the, the, the limits and the challenges in XML and it's important that you know exactly where we are. Okay? So it's important to know that we achieve it a lot because now we have a format to present images which has this kind of interoperability in the syntactic level. Okay? So we can exchange SVG files for any computer, any device, and they have the tools to interpret it. Okay? So everything is in the syntactical level, is explicit for machines. Okay? So even a machine can read the schema. Okay? A machine can read the schema and autom it will automatically know that uh, a rect element must appear inside an SVG element, for example. So, that the style X, Y, and so on applies to Rect. So, Rect can have these and these and these attributes. So, this is the role of the schema. Establish the syntactical thing so uh, the application will know how to handle this file. Okay? The answer for my question, if a machine can know, if it never saw that, is the machine can't. For this reason, this specific reason, we tell that XML 
has no semantic interoperability. So what is interoperability? You must understand what's interoperability. The idea is I we must exchange information and you will understand what I'm telling to you. This is interoperability. But interoperability means in several levels, okay? So uh, we can exchange synthetic things. So I can tell you the rules to produce this file and you, you never saw the rule. But you understand if you are a machine, you can get the schema and you, you will understand. Even if you are completely new, right? What is semantic interoperability? It's the same thing in the semantic level. So you never saw this thing. You don't know the meaning of the things, but you receive the thing and then you tell, okay, I can explain to you the meaning. Okay, explain to you to me. This is not a this is not an easy task. We will study that. It's not an easy task, and probably it's not a complete task yet. But there is this difference, right? Here, the semantics is all stored inside the application. In the sense, the application knows how to, what to do that with that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so the thing is, if you want to, to, if you want a program to interpret this thing, you, human being, must read the specification and code the way it will interpret. So it has no semantic interoperability in for the machines. We can tell it we have human <laughs> semantic interoperability, <laughs> right? But no, not for machines. Okay, so this is to show you that uh, we can do complex things as cells asked here. Uh, for example, I can draw, like you see there, a kind of polygons, curves, everything you may imagine in the vectorial thing, this language is able to do. For example, you have the path, and the path you can draw the thing you want, Whatever you want, you can draw in this guy, this thing. Okay? So now it's, it's becoming the standard for the web. Okay? You can even design an entire interface in SVG. Okay? If you want to see an example, I will show you after, uh, I will show you a good example. Uh, which is, I produce an application, okay, which is, there is no HTML, there is no HTML, it's 100% SVG. Why? Because this language is so powerful that you can draw the entire interface. You can, ima you can imagine the interface like a drawing, right, which is even more in some cases, if your interface is not exactly a document, is the interface of an application, for example, it's much better to use SVG because SVG has the freedom to draw things wherever you want. And when you, when you want to follow the same thing in HTML, it's a crazy thing. Okay? Because as, uh, HTML, sorry, or Facebook and Gmail and so on. So let me put here, now everybody on the web will see my mails. Good. Uh, let me see well, how can I find this thing is the chicken. The, uh, I want to show you the application but I must remember where is it. It's a competition. It's a competition. I participated mm, Global Game Jam. Global Game Jam. Okay. Okay. And here, if you want, you can see here.
Okay, it takes some time, but I will show you an application in which the interface is 100% SVG. You can put my surname here. Since I was a competitor. Okay, I'm here. And then you will find Lindaura the Chicken. Lindaura the Chicken is my game, okay? So here you see the game Lindaura the Chicken. And the thing in this game, Lindaura the Chicken, yeah, you see? It's good, right? Okay. You can even play it here, and if you see there, you see I'm calling an SVG file, there is no HTML. The browser reads SVG straight. It reads SVG, okay? It renders in the machine, because now it becomes a kind of, all the browsers now, uh, Firefox, Chrome, all, all of the browsers render straight SVG. No. Okay. So I don't know if I can put it, okay, inside the screen. So you see, so this is the, the game, and then you can tell to the chicken to go towards some place here, and to find his lovely, okay, and then you click that, and it. Yeah, it, this is a long story. You must read the stories. It's it's, uh, it's in fact uh, a chicken that thinks that is a dromedary, but it seems like a dinosaur. So it's something. <laughs> okay, but as everything here is SVG. Uh, okay, and then uh, uh, the the SVG here plays the role of HTML. So I draw everything I want, and each element I can attach to uh, JavaScript. So I can put JavaScript things connected to the SVG, straight to the SVG, without HTML in the middle. Okay? And the, the JavaScript now can interact with SVG in the same way it interacts with HTML. The same way. Okay? So it's fine. And I will tell you, I will show you why it, this is possible. It's because uh, a model, an object model, behind uh, XML. So since we have this model, the, our applications can treat both things as the same thing, as a tree of objects. Because since it's an hierarchy, it's an hierarchical model, okay? Both can be treated in the same way. Okay? All drawings here are vectors, uh, except the icons. Oh no, no, they are they are also vectors. But but yeah, yeah, yeah. If if for example, you you can see if I give you instructions to amplify, you see, you can go. The resolution you want, it you keep, you to maintain the 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 contour. Doesn't matter because it's a vectorial image. But SVG also accepts uh, bitmaps inside it. You can mix both if you want. So I I could put a, a bitmap there for the for the uh, sprites, for example. But I decide to put everything as a vector. Okay. And this is interesting. You see, it it's plastic. Okay. It's good for mobiles and so for on and so forth. Okay. So, so SVG has this important role. Okay. You can, and 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 the thing that I'm showing to you is the, exactly this thing. 
Okay, for example, uh, in, uh, I have, if you want, I have a course th that is in, available on the web when, when I, I teach how to interact the SVG and the JavaScript. Okay, so you can... Um, okay. So the idea is SVG, you break the box in the sense that HTML is too straight. Okay, so SVG you, you have the freedom and it, you can mix with Edge HTML if you wish. You can mix both. Okay, and uh, in how we do that by using namespaces. So by using namespaces, uh, we can put SVG inside HTML. Okay, but uh, and it interacts with JavaScript. But what you must know, what you must know, is that even though I can mix HTML with SVG, even though I can mix both, okay, there are specific ways to mix them. Okay. So, there is a specific parts of HTML in which I can insert SVG. It's not like I can put whatever I want. Okay? And this is the thing in, in, in XML we must pay attention. You, you can combine things, but in a predefined way. Okay? So, in the HTML specification, there is a spot predefined to insert SVG, okay? Because XML is not designed to mix things in the way you want. It's not designed to do that, okay? You must predefine the ways you can make things, okay? Because since uh, XML has rigid schemas, rigid, okay? Uh, you can even break an application if you do not follow the schema. Okay? So, for example, you can try to get an SVG file and put strange things in the middle and then open it in a application that interprets SVG. And if you do the in the right way, the application will just stop of working. It will break in the middle or you do something. Why? Because you, you must be rigid when you have an XML schema. So this is some... Uh, you can interact uh, SVG with CSS. Okay? So you can interact SVG with CSS in the same way you can interact HTML with CSS. Okay? And I did that in my application. And this is really beautiful. If you like interfaces. It's really beautiful. Okay, you can do animations in SVG. Okay, you can animate things. In the past, they are preparing SVG to be the successor of Flash. Okay, I saw a presentation ten years ago. People showing SVG doing the same things of Flash. I don't know why they didn't uh, follow this path, but animations in SVG is an old thing. Okay, so this is animation techniques. If you are interested in that, I have a course on the web when you can learn how to do these things, okay? Okay, so here is some examples how to do animations and so on and so forth. The thing that you must see is Everything is everything is XML. Everything is defined in an XML schema. Okay. You have tools like Inkscape. Inkscape is a tool in which you can draw things and you can uh, export and you can save them in SVG. Okay. But several tools today export to SVG or import from SVG. For example, OpenOffice has this drawing tool that exports and imports SVG. Okay? So you can use that also. I don't know if the Microsoft tools already support SVG. I don't know. 
but it's possible. PowerPoint and so on. But now I want to show you the other face of XML. Okay? The other face. Because if you pay attention here, when I present to you SVG, people usually they don't talk about metadata. Okay? They, don't, they are talking about a language to describe images, right? To define how images are drawn. Okay? So uh, uh, XML has this operational role of language to do things, right? MathML to express things in mathematics. For example, I want um, a language for multimedia. So we have Smile. Smile is a language to put things in multimedia. Okay? So this is one role of, of uh, XML. But there is another role that people use a lot, which is XML for metadata. Okay? So what is metadata? Metadata is data about data. Okay? So in this case, we are considering we have data. Okay? We have something. And we want to use XML to describe this data, to describe something. So it's a different role here. It's, it's, sometimes it's not easy to devise. Sometimes they are mixed together. Okay? But it's just to understand the roles. Okay? So uh, if you have a schema, it is a standard for documentation. And when you have metadata, you can the, the, to search something. Okay? The evaluation of something can be more effective. Okay. So, to understand how XML is used to describe things, let's take a look in models to describe. Okay, so we want to describe something. Let's start describing something. So, let's start to describing this Plesiosaurus. I think everybody knows what is a Plesiosaurus, right? It's a common... No? 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 The the lockless uh, how can I say the lockless monster you know of the lake you know this monster of the lake people think is a plesiosaurus okay it has a long neck and goes in the waters okay beautiful animal okay in the past doesn't exist anymore okay so a plesiosaurus uh, I, I'm considering here a museum, and I want to describe a plesiosaurus. Okay, so I, I produce a, 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 a card. You may imagine with me a card. Okay, so uh, there is a, an identifier there, and there are fields. Okay, with with the the specimen, sorry, the species and the origin. And when it was recognized, and the size, 5 meters, you may imagine, is not so small. Okay. So now, I want to use these things to describe my plesiosaurus. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, so, you may imagine I have several of these things. Okay. And you can ask me, but Andre, why you are talking this as a metadata, not as a data? Okay? So what is the boundary between data and metadata? This is really difficult to define precisely the boundaries. Okay? Usually metadata, if, if you have some data and you want to use other data to describe the data you have. For, so, so, for example, you may imagine you have a collection of pictures of animals or other things and you want to produce these cards to describe the things, to, to attach metadata to them. So, you may imagine your, your files like a, a bunch of cards. So, this is just a, 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 an hypothetical image. Okay? And then I ask you, Okay, guys, but how I will share these things? Okay, I, I'm trying to follow follow the web path. Okay, 
So the first thing is, okay, I want to share this thing. How you want to share? So before the web, people told, okay, I have a table. A table is a beautiful thing, right? Like a spreadsheet or something. You just put the, the columns there and then you put the date inside it and that's it. Okay? This is really good. So we have the relational databases. When I put the, my tables and I connect the tables and everything is solved. So uh, tables are excellent to manage data with a predictable static schema. Predictable static schema. But what about sharing? Okay, if I want to share things with other people, does this thing is good? What's the limits? Okay, the first thing is when you have a table, you put everything together in the same space because tables were designed, were considered to manage your data, but not to share pieces of data, parts of data. It's not this the idea, right? So, and if I want to share, if I want to send to someone something, okay. Then, people consider the powerful approach of a document, the powerful idea of a document, okay? A document is something self-contained, right? I put everything in a document and I send to you a document, okay? And then you receive the document and you, uh, you have everything you need, you read this document and you have your data, right? So, uh, so for this reason, in my point of view, XML is hierarchical because it follows this idea of documents we share in the real world, right? Uh, so, uh, the idea of document as something to share is so powerful that if you get some standards for web services. I think you know what's a web service, right? So when you have web services, you exchange messages between services. Okay? And one of the approaches to exchange data is a document. So a service sends to the other service a document. Because it has this self-contained thing, this hierarchical structure where you put everything there and you send it. Okay? So, you may imagine our plesiosaurus as a document, and you put the, the, the structures and the code of the fields there, and the, the data there, yeah. you see? And you may, you see that inside each element, inside each document, you have everything. You have the structure, the schema, and the data, okay? I mean, it's not exactly the schema. You will define the schema uh, apart, but you have the, you define each field, what's the content, and so on and so forth. And even though, even though you can, you must follow a rigid schema. Okay, you have more plasticity. In the sense that you have, you can have several variations of the structure, so our documents can have or not parts of the description. Okay, so this is really good, and for this reason, I think XML uh, expanded a lot. It fits in the idea of the web. It fits in the idea that you share things. You can have your website. And people can just get your document with the data they need. And that's it. Right? It's not necessarily a database or a table or nothing. Is Everything is there. And I will show you how it increased. Because several domains started to think, Oh, good. I can produce a document to describe a learning object. I can produce a document to describe a multimedia artifact or uh, some experiment 
or some sample. So people started to sing several documents. Each document can describe something. Isn't so you know? Okay. One problem when you are thinking about documents is their hierarchical structure. Okay? Why? So <laughs> sorry about that. It's out of the is not aligned, but the thing is, consider that here you have Lyme Regis, which is a lake, a place where they found this uh, thing. And here is also Lyme Regis. You see, these two guys are the same guy, right? And if you see here, this is a species, which is the same species of here. They are the same species, okay? And uh, here you see United States and United States, okay? So then what you start to think, if you remember database, you want to normalize. In the sense that you have several information that are, um, they are not, they are, um, how can I say, repeated. Right? And, and when you repeat the information, you have several drawbacks, several consequences. For example, uh, consistency, uh, you, you, don't, you, you, you don't have the guarantees that you identify them as the same entity, okay, as the same thing. So, and, and we, we look on this issue further, okay, there is one topic we study how we can know that two things are the same thing. So, for example, how can I know that Lyme Regis here and Lyme Regis there is talking about the same thing? I don't know. Okay? And this is one of the limits of XML. Since XML it doesn't have semantic interoperability, you just put data there. Okay? And then, the application you try to do the best with your data, right? So, uh, the, the question is, how much hierarchical is, in fact, your data? Why am I asking that? Because, in fact, we started with this idea, okay, uh, hierarchical documents are good, but they are good to share, but does your data is really hierarchical? How? What is the price to pay when you want to put everything in a hierarchical model? Okay. Then you can come back to the database. Okay. And you can tell me that um, in databases it's easier to produce such relationships, right? Because in databases, in relational databases, I can just normalize things, right? You can just tell, okay, these three guys here are the same guy, these two guys, this, I can tell that the second guy there is renamed of the first one, or near, and so on. So, but then, you start to think the following, okay, you designed your schema, okay, for the table. You pre-designed your schema, right? And after you design your schema, people start to want more. Oh, okay. I want to know that this column here inclu is included. Now, I'm talking about semantics, okay? If you remember... Ah, no, it's not in this class. Uh, when I is, I'm teaching uh, database, for the class of database, we are discussing how you define, how you draw a relational schema. Okay, a schema in a relational database. Okay, so for example, you put two columns like uh, uh, origin, place, and country. Okay, and you just put names. How do you know that uh, uh, in a spatial term, one thing is included in the other? How do you know that? 
that the second, the, the first column is uh, a sub part of the first column. So the second column is the country. So England, for example, which is a big place. And the, the, the left column is inside England. Right? So how can I know that? How can I define that in the schema in such a way that the application you read and understand? Okay, so how can I know, for example, that these two places are one near to the other? How can I know that the second uh, name, Triceratops oridus, is a new name for the same animal, Triceratops calicomis? Okay, what happens in a classic thing, in a classic scenario, is that people start to produce more and more uh, modifications in the application so to fit the, the request okay so if I am a developer I can change my program to to meet all these requests but it you take a lot of effort to redraw redesign the application to meet the request are you following me yeah everybody's following me okay so uh, there is this trade-off of static schemas Uh, you remember that I told you that XML is rigid, right? And you must define the spots in which you put things together. What happens when you have like this? This is a, a work that a, a, a student uh, did. Uh, uh, of the several standards to describe a species. Just that. So you just get one simple thing. Okay, I want to describe a species. Okay? How can I do that? Or a specimen? Okay? You have several things. And sometimes they are complementary. Sometimes they compete with each other. And when you find all these things and you see this scenario the first question is can I integrate them can I connect them in some way then you start to see that the rigidity of XML schema is not designed to mix okay it's not designed to mix so it's designed to use to follow that schema and when it's possible you can you can predefine some spots to put things together, like I told you XML, oh, SVG, and HTML, right? Did you understand that? Okay, so I'm showing you at the same time the XML word and the limits of the XML word, right? So, and why I'm telling that for you? Because in the beginning of uh, XML, it was an explosion of standards. And people are really happy. Okay, now we can put metadata, everything in XML. Until now, people are in this level, doing a lot in XML. So, for example, you have Dublin Core for digital libraries. And math, you have a la several standards there, MPEG 7, MPEG 21. All these standards is, for example, this MPEG standards is to describe multimedia artifacts. The, seven, the MPEG 7 is to describe streams, like videos and sounds. And you can annotate parts of the streams. Okay? And the MPEG 21 is a standard, so you can describe complex artifacts, complex multimedia artifacts, okay? Dublin Core and Maths are standards to describe resources in general. If you imagine a digital library where you have several things, you can use them to describe. And then you have, for example, standards for education. So you have the learning object metadata, which is a standard to describe what they call learning objects, which is 
you may imagine digital objects to learn something okay and you have the learning design which is a, a standard to describe uh, how your learning thing uh, will follow some kind of uh, design or some kind of sequence of things and so on you have a standard like GML to describe uh, the geography of something you have sensor ML to describe uh, sensor to to define data of sensors you have things in in health like mesh or dex which are the f which is for define uh, for example uh, symptoms diseases parts of the body and the relations of the things but all these things are in xml you have biology standards like uh, SDD to describe uh, phenotypes, Darwin core to describe species, uh, and all, all other standards to describe taxonomies, species, and related things. Right? The problem is okay, when you go to the web, all these guys are XML. Some of them will use the next level, like Dublin Core, you use the next level, which is Semantic Web, but you not talk about that now. But uh, all these standards follow XML, you see? So XML is something that is spreading on all these standards. It's like, uh, if you are talking about metadata, let's use XML. It's a kind of growl, or something like holy growl, something that silver bullet solves everything so it's like you get your I, I we are read so that you get your thing and you you just put this is I'm showing a platform to describe living beings and I showing how you do that uh, by using for example SDD this is expert a tool to describe things but it also spots to a, a standard we call SDD. So what's SDD? SDD is a standard uh, to describe living beings. Okay? And then there is a funny thing here. Because, for example, uh, you want to describe a living being. And you want to tell that, for example, you are describing this uh, lizard here. Okay? And then you want to tell that this lizard has a specific kind of tongue. You see? Okay, but then when you see that, you see here, you see that there is a reference instead of the word tongue. What's the problem there? The problem is you can describe the tongue of several living beings. Okay? So you have another section in which you define tongue. And you give it a code, 18 or 8, right? C8, for example, is a code for tongue, right? And then you remember that when I present to you XML, I have ID ref, I can reference another uh, ID in another place of the document. So I use ID ref to tell, okay. Tongue is something that is in the other part of the document. I link things, right? So in this way, I can try to normalize and link things. And what's the limits of XML? Why I'm telling you that XML is hard to, uh, to have semantic interoperability why XML is hard to mix? Why XML is hard to interpret? The first problem in XML is if I give you something to describe, okay? So if you give you a phrase like uh, uh, Mr. Horace or Mr. Horacio is the author of the page in this address, okay? And I want to describe it in XML. Okay? Okay? Can you do me a favor? I think everybody of you now knows how to do things in XML, right? I want you to 
the, to, the, to write that in XML by using tags and so on and so forth. I want you to um, put that in XML, not XML schema. You put an example in XML defining this kind of thing. Five minutes. Go, 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 go. you learn what will you learn in this thing you will learn the following there are, there are several ways to do the same thing and this is the first problem in XML for example I can do in this way you see people here in this class some of people did in this way okay you have for example a root and you have a tag for each part of the information we wish. Okay, is this right? Yes, it's right. 
Can I do in this way? For example, okay, the re reference I put in as an attribute, and then there is um, another thing whose attribute is author, and then the content. Is it right? Yes, yes, it's right. Okay, but I can also do in this way. So instead of having a standard attribute with the with the uh, uh, a standard element with the attribute telling which is an outer, I can have a outer element, right? Uh, okay, okay, it's right also. Okay, but I can also do in this way. So I put uh, just one element and everything has attributes. Yes, it's possible. Okay. And I can stay here all the night showing you hundreds of ways of doing the same thing. And all these ways are right. And I will see communities discussing what's the best way, what you must do or not. And the problem is there is no standard way to design a schema for even for the simplest thing you want to describe. And I will show you, when we go to the upper level, this is the first thing we want to solve. Okay? This is the first thing. Because, okay, it's not possible to an application to automatically interpret something. If even the basic thing, which is the structure of the thing, there is no standard way to do that. So you will find a kind of strange thing to read in several ways without any better uh, option. Okay? There are people that are trying to do that. But the problem is, you may imagine that machines is the next generation. They will kill us. Uh, no, it's uh, just kidding. But, I mean, machines, in fact, machines are uh, another, the, another kind of th way of thinking, let's say. Okay? So, our language is, is designed, it is produced for us. It's a good approach for us, but not a good approach for machines. You can even train machines to understand our language. And there are several works trying to do that. And they are improving. They are keeping improving. But it's not a good approach for machines. Just that. And why not? Because there is a lot of ambiguity, okay? There is a lot of things that, depending on the context and so on and so forth, it's like, okay, so we can redesign our language. <laughs> it's something that's not, I think, is also is not possible, even not possible, because the thing is, uh, in our brain, there is something. This is a theory, right? But in our brain, there is something that is already prepared to acquire and to use a language. Okay? So it's something that is, you have this skill in your abilities. You have, you are prepared to acquire a language. Okay? So, uh, if, it, if people try like Esperanto, I don't know if you know Esperanto, which is a language which has artificially Designed by a community, right? Which will be the international language. Okay? Doesn't work. Why not? Because the theory is if you get people that never, this is a theory, because it's almost impossible to find these people, but, or to put these people in the lab, but because we have uh, ethical problems. Okay? But if you pick, get people, and you put them together, even if they never had contact with a language, okay? And they produce a language from scratch. 
This language problem you have characteristics similar to our languages. Okay? It is, it's, it's attached to the way of how people uh, work in their brain. Okay? And the same thing is for machines. If you are designing a language for machines, you must consider machines, not the human brain. Do you understand the, the argument? Yeah, but the thing is, how your brain works in the semantic. We we will discuss that because the semantic for machines is inspired in our own way to define semantics. Okay, so we design machines trying to uh, with some properties of how we we uh, use semantics. Okay, so semantics for us is connections. Connections. It's the easiest way to tell you what semantics is when your neuron do the connection with some kind of energy. It's connection. So when I tell you cat, okay, and people study that in semiotics. I don't know if you studied EHC here, semiotics and these things, HCI, okay, human computer interaction. But in the semiotics, when I talk cat, it's like I trigger something that in your brain brings to this thing, which this, okay, we call the sign that tells you, clicks on this part of your brain, where is cat, okay, so I do the connection, and this is semantics for you, okay. So you try to simulate the same thing in the machines, but in a different approach, right? Because we are talking about machines, not humans. Yeah, I mean, in, in 100 years, at the end, we can learn that the best way is the human brain. And, oh God, we spent a lot of time and the best way is the human brain. I don't know. But for now, we don't think so, right? So, the several standards, I will present you a brief of such standards because I need to present them to you so we can discuss some limits. So, standards based on XML, like Dublin Core or learning objects, what they do. I will just jump this part, which is details of learning objects, and I want to show you a typical schema. In these standards, they tell you which are the elements, which are the attributes. But then, there is a part of the standard in which they want to tell you the possible things you put inside the elements. So, for example, when you have the schema of uh, learning objects, okay, we want to tell the kind of object, okay? Is it uh, a simulation? Is it uh, a figure, a graph, a problem? Okay, so you have types of learning objects. Okay, the problem is there is no standard way to produce a taxonomy in XML. There is no standard way to do that in XML. So you tell the guy, just put a word. And this word will mean, I don't know, uh, simulation, or this word will mean. Uh, questionnaire, for example. So you have several words. And what happens if the word I need is not in the list? <laughs> Which is usual, right? It's highly usual. The thing I, I want to describe is not in this list. I want to produce a new one. All the time people want to produce a new a word, a new thing. All the time. And why? Because the committee that produced the standard, they don't know all the possible 
options. They tried their best, but limited to their knowledge, right? And when you start to span the things, okay, you start to learn that uh, if you have several people adding new words, okay, so you have several people, as happened in the learning objects, adding new terms. The thing is, how can I interpret the terms? <laughs> because there is no standard way to do that. It's just words lost. And people will use different words for the same meaning. Okay? So people you use simulation, other people use simulação in Portuguese. Other people use similar words to the same thing. Okay? Okay. So this is how we do in sensors. And uh, when we talk about metadata and semantics, uh, uh, there is an interesting, there is an interesting paper you must read Okay, this paper is uh, is here. Uh, this Erfenbergen, I will show in the end, which they call the. I don't remember now the title, but it's an interesting. They they analyze why people use uh, metadata. Okay, so they tell that applications can do traditional traditional uh, tasks but if you want semantics is because you want to ask to your application to do things that were not designed in advance so for example okay please give me an a, 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 a script of tasks based on these things so you may imagine that you ask to your machine new things and just the machine must be able to interpret the semantics and, and know how to do these new things. This is the idea. And then they tell that semantics is also connected to the context. Okay? So, in some sense, the machine must interpret the context to do what to do. So, the first thing, and is the thing that we will talk after, is we must have explicit semantics. And explicit semantics is something important that we don't find in XML. So, there is an interesting paper I like a lot in biology. They publish in Nature, showing a simple example. Okay, for example... I want to describe uh, things in, in uh, I want to describe things in genomes, okay? And there are more than one standard to describe things in genome, okay? And the paper argues exactly the thing I show you to you. First, there are several structures, several ways to do the same thing, right? And so, the paper shows two standards to do the same thing and show they do in different ways. So, for example, this guy here, uh, the area, the position and the area is in one way. This guy here doing this different way. And they argue the thing is, how can I know, for example, uh, how can I know in this kind of standard? that these four attributes here are related to a kind of shape. How can I know that? Because this is not explicit in the, in the description. So I know there is number there, but it's not explicit this is an area, a rectangular area. Okay? There is no shape. So the paper shows how we can do that in a semantic standards and we will study that. How semantic standards will help us. 
So the, the paper I told you is that obscure object of the, the desire, multimedia metadata. Okay? There are two parts and it's really a good paper if you want to see an overview of metadata. So uh, today I showed you the world of XML, the things people are doing, and it's not to tell that XML is not good. In fact, XML is really very good. And people achieved to do several exchanges of data by using syntactic interoperability provided by XML. So XML achieved an excellent stage of interoperability if you are considering the syntax and the structure. Is perfect. Okay? Applications can exchange devices, mobiles, everything. They can interpret the syntax. They can read the schemas and it's perfect. Okay? But people want to use it for metadata and when they tell, okay, this is metadata, we are achieving the limits, the boundaries. People are thinking that, oh God, you see, for example, in the ge ge geography context that I know, the standards are becoming so big with so many details because if you want to put everything in the schema, the schema becomes like thousands of pages of a specification, right? So if you want to produce an application to read this thing and to do something with this thing, since the semantics is for humans, for us, you must have humans to read all the specification, to understand it, to interpret, and to program machines to do something. So, this is becoming a mess, a problem, because we are not achieving to read and to interpret all this bunch of schemas, even because we have several competing schemas to do the same thing. Right? To do the same thing. Okay? So, we are expanding a lot of time redoing work because we need people, we need you to interpret the things, to tell the machines how they you handle these things. And what we want is, okay, just drop it. Let the machines talk themselves. Okay? So, one machine will explain the other. Okay, this is the area. This is the thing, and the other machine will, okay, okay, I understand, I can do that. Okay, not understand, because I'm trying to avoid words that let you think that we are talking, we are talking about artificial intelligence. Okay? We are not talking about artificial intelligence. When I talk about semantics, I, if I use the words uh, understand, is not the right word. Okay? I don't want the machine understand things. Because understand things like an intelligent behavior. Okay? And it's not the thing we are looking here. Okay? We are looking to interpret, which is different. In the sense that I must write in a way that some other part can read and do something with this thing. Because it can interpret. And when we talk about interpret, we have several layer levels of interpretation, which is the topest is semant. No, it's not. I don't know if it's semantics. People argue that there are more layers, okay? But semantics is the next layer, right? Okay? Did you understand? Questions? Good. So let's finish it today. And.